and we're away. So, uh, morning everybody. Um, welcome to the session. I'll just run through a quick introduction and then I'll hand over to Chris. Uh, so the session we've got this morning is um, regression modeling in R, as far as I'm aware. And we've got Chris Maney here from the uh, University Hospitals Birmingham Trust. Um, I will put a few links in the chat to the, the NHR, NHSR GitHub and um, R Studio links. And at the end, I'll put a link up for the um, for a kind of survey at the end of the session to see how you guys found everything. Um, there will be a, a couple of moments where we have uh, breakout rooms, so don't be too worried if you get booted out of this chat and into a breakout room. Similarly, um, just chuck any questions you have in the chat box, um, and if you can, you know, keep yourselves muted if there's any, any background noise. Otherwise, I'll pass over to Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, morning, everyone. So um, let me just share my screen first of all. Okay, so you should have my slides there now, he says optimistically. Yep. Right. Um, so yeah, my name is Chris Maney. Um, I'm Senior Data Scientist at the University Hospital Birmingham, um, specifically in the HED team. So uh, we build um, a HES-based benchmarking system to compare hospital activity, mortality, readmissions, and, and other sorts of information. It's used by about 50 to 60 NHS organizations and a few uh, other partners at the moment. So we are NHS Informatics, but we have a slightly different remit to some of the, um, the, the other people who uh, we encounter through NHSR community. Um, I'm gonna be looking at regression modeling this morning uh, and leading you through um, how you, you start doing that in R, what, what you uh, will need to know in terms of getting the best out of it. Um, and I'll try and relate it really to some of the things that we've done in practice and where and how we use that. What I'll do um, in terms of structure, uh, I'll run through a reasonable amount of theory, first of all. I'll try not to get too heavy, but there are there is a couple of uh, equations here and there, but I'll try and fully illustrate why they're useful because they help you understand what the regression is doing. Uh, in terms of then applying it, I've then got a number of workshops for you, sorry, a number of exercises for you throughout the workshop. We'll move in and out of them between different sections of the slide. So we'll start with, a, as I say, a fair chunk of uh, theory, then we'll do an exercise, then we'll do a little more, an exercise, etc., and we'll alternate through. Uh, we'll finish up with a uh, kind of putting it together exercise where I'll give you free reign for building the best regression model you can on a particular data set. So we're going to aim to finish by 12 and we will stop a few times along the way. So I think what we'll probably do for the exercise sessions is we'll put you into breakout rooms. The exercises work just fine if you want to go through them on your own, but it might be that you want to discuss your progress as you go, ask other people's opinions, uh, if any of it's unclear, sometimes it helps to get a second opinion on something. Let me just show you the R Studio setup as well, so that you are clear uh, how to get through that. Uh, I believe Alex is putting the links in the, the chat for you. So if you're not already connected to R Studio Cloud, uh, do go and get yourself connected and um, get yourself into the session. If you downloaded the stuff from my uh, GitHub, repository, then that's fine. Open that in your normal R Studio, uh, and we can work from there. So I'll just move uh, my cloud session over here. So uh, there are some prerequisites today for you having at least a, a passable knowledge of navigating R. So I'm not going to be teaching you any basic syntax, because I would expect really that you, you have that in place to be able to, to uh, apply this to regression models. So we have a normal R Studio window, but it's embedded in your browser. If you want a little more space, um, turn your browser to full screen so you can do that uh, in Chrome like I'm using there with F11 and that just gives you a bit more space. If you find you've got this um, R Studio thing stuck on the side here, you can use this pin here once to unpin it and twice to get rid of it and that'll push that off the side and give you a bit more space to work with. And just like you would use normal R Studio, you can open a script here and work or you can type directly in the console. Um, and you have your um, normal controls here for connections for your environment, etc. So in the repository that I've set up, I have um, a PDF copy of the slides I'm going through. I have the HTML of the slides, and the slides are all written in our markdown. So if you want to go in and pull any of the code out of them, you, you can see the code as we go, but you can go in um, and pull the code out of those in the RMD file or view the HTML. 
There are a number of exercises as well. So one and two are lumped into the same script and three and four are in the same script as well. And I'll go through these again as we get there. But the way the exercises work is that I have a number of annotations at the top of the script telling you what it is we're going to look at. Then you step through the loading and then follow the instructions as you go. So each section will give you an instruction of what to do in the section below. But as I say, we'll come back to them as we get there. Okay, so uh, regression modeling. So what I'm gonna go through today then is firstly correlation. So the first thing you will generally be asked to do if you're doing something that would probably be good as a regression model is someone will ask you if some things are related. Uh, so correlation is often a standard first step uh, in terms of understanding whether two variables are related. We'll look at the slightly more powerful approach to doing that then with a, a linear model, a linear regression, uh, and specifically we'll then use the LM function in R, which is the standard for uh, linear models. Uh, there are a number of other frameworks, particularly the RMS um, framework. So if you're if you're interested in that, Frank Harrell's RMS framework is quite good as well. But uh, we'll use BASAR's LM function here. Um, you can also um, then apply a bunch of other things to LM models to uh, diagnose how, how good the model fit is uh, and then to further use them for prediction. So we'll look at how we can then apply some other elements. So what do we do with categorical variables, for example? Um, once we've got a fitted model, how do we then use that model to predict onto new data? And we'll also look at, um, once we understand a linear model, how do we then apply the same sort of idea for a linear model to some data that isn't linear? So something like um, a binary. So if we had a model to predict deaths or readmissions where people are or aren't, um, so it's a zero or one, uh, uh, true or false, how could we do that? So we'll look specifically at logistic regression, which is an extension of that through a so-called generalized linear model. So the essence of what we're doing really is looking for relationships between variables. So if someone says correlated, they're suggesting that those two variables have a relationship. So if one of them increases or decreases, it has a proportional effect um, on the other variable. It may have an effect in the same direction. It may have an effect in a different direction. So as one increases, the other one may decrease. Um, and the rate at which they're associated might be different. Um, so the way we generally consider a uh, correlation then is usually the, uh, the strength of the correlation, so how, how tightly they are um, linked together, and the direction of that association. So as I say, does one increase or decrease the other? So there's, there's two common, um, so we, we're in a, so a, for the, the statisticians amongst you, we're definitely in a frequentist framework here. And although regression moves over to Bayesian, I'm not considering this particularly from a Bayesian perspective at this point in time. So um, we are going to consider these two types of um, techniques. We're going to look at correlation. Correlation really is just about trying to show how closely related they are in the strength whereas the regression gives us an estimate of uh, one or more predictors and how much they affect a particular predictor. And we can also do things like diagnose areas in a regression where it doesn't fit very well. So really regression is the more powerful of the two, but for context, we'll just have a quick look at correlation first. So we also have to bear in mind that when we look at a single regression, so um, a single X variable predicting a single Y variable. It's perfectly possible that there's another X variable that interacts with Y, but if that X variable interacts with the other X, uh, it can mask the effects. So one of the famous ones for this um, was in a, a study in uh, heart disease. Uh, so if you were to include just alcohol consumption to predict um, heart disease, uh, that had an effect. If you were to look for just smoking status, whether that had an effect, um, that also had an effect. But the two together actually both approximated some of each other because at the time smoking was quite associated with drinking. So often people who smoked and drank did so in pubs uh, and the two things were associated. So we need to look um, in some cases where we have variables that interact and mask each other. And this tends to be referred to as confounding. So as a bit of context, I'm going to try and visualize it and show you. So I'll put the, the script here to show you what I'm doing. So what I've got here for my X, so X is this axis on the graph. 
I've got some random um, normal variables, 50 of which with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of four. So this is just the R norm function, which generates normal, uh, normal distributed variables. I've then got a uniform distribution equivalent for 50 variables with a minimum of uh, 0.1, sorry, a minimum of 0.5 and a maximum of 10 plus 1.25 times x. So critically here, I've specified a relationship on x. So as x increases, y will increase as well with some noise. So I've set it up essentially here. So this is a, as probably as clear a correlation as you're going to see from a scatter plot. Um, and then we've drawn that out in ggplot. So I would suggest always when you're going to something like this, if you've got two variables, at least as a baseline, do plot them, do have a look at the relationship because that can tell you a lot more than going straight into a regression model. Because if you have, uh, let's say a plot like this, but you have a huge dip in the middle, um, you wouldn't see that from the regression model. So do consider plotting them first, it really does help. So here it looks pretty much as X increases, Y increases. So to apply a correlation then, uh, we tend to measure them with a correlation coefficient. Uh, there's a number of different correlation coefficients, but normally for, um, for most things, we start with a Pearson correlation coefficient, um, which is a, a sort of a, from the same stable as t-tests and essentially, uh, it's assuming that you have two normally distributed um, numeric variables that you're comparing. So how you use this then is you, you apply the correlation um, function to it and we get a coefficient out of it, which I'll show you in a minute, where the range of the output is a zero, a minus one to a one. So the minus one is a perfect negative correlation. I'll show you this visually in a second. And one is a perfect positive correlation. But if you get a correlation coefficient of zero, it shows that the, it, it is suggesting that there is no correlation between them. So what do some of those correlations look like then? So here, um, and with thanks to Wikipedia, shameless pull from Wikipedia here, um, I have the correlation coefficients for a few different sets of scatter plots. So here you can see the perfect positive correlation of one. And actually where that correlation is not quite so tight, but it's still in the same direction, we've got 0.8. And then as we decrease down there to 0.4, you can see actually the cloud is widening out. When we get to zero, actually, there doesn't appear to be much pattern there at all. It appears to be um, quite random. Then when we see the minus four, actually, it's going in the opposite direction as y increases, um, sorry, as x increases, y decreases. Similarly with 0.8, and then the minus one is that perfect negative correlation as well. And a word of warning, if you have one, so a perfect correlation, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's a 45 degree slope across your plot. So you can see here, these other lines here are um, perfect positive correlation, but the magnitude of the increase differs between them. And again, we have a zero there, but you'll also see there's, um, some people take great delight in this from a, a, a data nerding perspective, but there are many different ways where you can get patterns where when you sum them up, you get a zero correlation, but it's very clear that there is a pattern in these here. So just because you get no um, pattern from a correlation coefficient doesn't mean there's, there's no pattern in the data, if that makes sense. So this is where it's, um, I'll, I'll reiterate the point of, of do make sure you plot them because that will really tell you a lot. A question from, from Noor who's asking, yeah, sure. are there any kind of prescribed criteria as to when to call um, a certain coefficient, uh, correlation coefficient, uh, strong or weak? Um, is there a kind of cutoff point that where it goes from being kind of... Um, yeah, so I would... Um, so I, I think conventional wisdom is generally that 0.8 and above is a strong correlation, but I think it's a little bit context dependent. Uh, personally, for, uh, I'm going to be an annoying statistician and sit on the fence slightly and say, uh, it sort of a little bit depends on your application and how big the data set is and all sorts of things. Um, so I, I think depending on your problem is what you're happy to live with, but I think most people would regard above 0.8 as a strong correlation. Uh, so just in terms of then doing that in R, uh, it's a reasonably simple function. So I've got my X variables and my Y variables that I had on the previous slide. 
So if I run a correlation test with the car function, you can see I get my correlation coefficient out there and it defaults to a Pearson one here. There are some other options here. If you look in the help files, you could see that you could specify different types of correlations, um, but that's given a correlation of 0.865. So, um, so essentially you can see, you can read that like an R squared, which we'll see later, which is essentially saying about 86.5% of it, the uh, variation is explained by the other, but um, essentially it's, it's a high correlation. If you want a significance test with that, because often people do then want a, a measure of, can I put some um, some trust in this? Uh, we get into the, the land of t-tests, uh, significance tests, and uh, without disappearing down the, um, do you use a p-value or not rabbit hole? Um, this default correlation test assumes that you want to do a t-test between the two and that you're happy enough with a 95% limit which is the, the common limit for it, but you can change the limits, um, et cetera, et cetera. But if you do core test instead of core, it will give you um, the output underneath here. So we have um, our T values, uh, we have the, the P value. So obviously that's to the minus 16, so it's very small. So it's a significant correlation. You can see there's a correlation coefficient there from above, but it's also giving you a 95% confidence interval around that. So the rain, so uh, with a 95% confidence, we can say that the correlation of that data set is somewhere between 0.772 and 0.921 with our estimate being 0.865. So these are really good, useful tests if you have two variables and they're reasonably normally distributed. Um, but if it starts to get a little bit more complicated, you've got more than one variable, you will probably want to go straight for the regression approach. And I would normally go for straight for a regression approach. So how does it then differ from the correlation? So it's a little bit more involved uh, for a start. So to show you what I've done here, I've done two things on this page. So firstly, I've built a linear model using the LM function. We'll do this and we'll look in it in a bit more detail in a minute. But what I've done is I've created an object called Z with this assigned function. And Z is a linear model where we're predicting Y. Y was the variables we had created on the other slide a minute ago. We're predicting y using x. And then I've um, taken the plot that I created before. I created an object with that plot. Let me just nip back there. This created a plot called a, uh, and I'm reusing a each time to put the different layers on so that you can see that. So there I'm putting an additional layer on a, which is a smoother. Now the default smooth will do some clever things with local smoothers, but you can tell it which method to use. So I'm telling it fit a smoother using a linear model. So the method is LM. So this is plotting the same thing that that model is doing essentially. I then told it to draw the smoother through the data set there. So it's a line of best fit. So things to note there, in the center of the data, the confidence interval is a bit narrower. So the weight of numbers is much higher in the middle and it tends to widen out a little bit towards the end. But what we've actually got going on here for the linear model is that the linear model is dealing with an equation with a set of assumptions. So it's dealing with predicting y for the first point. And we're predicting y using an alpha, which I'll, I'll show you the definition of that in a second, and then a beta times x, so the x is value here, and then an error term. So what does that actually mean? Okay, so here's the apologies for the equations, but hopefully if we step through this, this makes sense. So Y is our outcome. It's that vertical axis that we're trying to predict. So that could be length of stay, height of patients, time in hospital, you know, whatever it is you're trying to predict. We're then saying that according to this equation of a straight line, which is what it's based on, we can predict i by knowing the alpha, so the intercept. So that's the point where that line crosses the y-axis. So the horizontal, sorry, the, the vertical axis. We then add our values of x. But what we need to know is how much to multiply our x value by to predict it. So if I go back to this here, so I want to know that for each unit of one that I increase on this x-axis, how much does y go up? And that's what this beta represents. 
It represents how much we are multiplying each of these x values by to get a prediction. So if I said, knowing my intercept and knowing that x equals five, I want to be able to read off that y then equals, I don't know, 12 and a half. So we're getting a beta. This beta value is referred to as a regression coefficient and it's a weight. So it's, it's how much x is multiplied by to predict y. Uh, the index I've got here with i, um, this is to tell you that um, you can do this as many times as you want. So at the moment, we're just using one predictor. We're saying x is predicted, sorry, y is predicted by x. But we can have many, many different predictors. So i is to indicate that we could have as many of these beta x's as possible. And you'll see that as we go through when we look at a regression, a multiple regression, so regression with more than one predictor. And then we also have an eta term as well, so the um, the remaining error. So it's not perfect, our model. So if you go back here, you'll see that despite the fact that we've got this model here, it doesn't perfectly predict each of these points, does it? They're spaced off the line. So that's where the error comes in. So it's the, the remaining distance. Um, let me just uh, see. I think I spotted something on the chat there. Oh, sorry, I've missed that point on the um, the the correlation. So um, we'll see this. Um, so so sorry, I'm going to probably bounce that until a little bit later. But what I'm going to say is that you can interpret that in the same way that you could interpret the R squared value, which is the proportion of the variation in Y that is explained by X. So if we had a correlation coefficient of 0.8 and above, we're saying it explains over 80% of the variation. So it's, um, it, it's, it's not quite a perfect um, analogy, but broadly that's how people would use an R squared and it applies across to uh, your interpretation of the correlation coefficient as well. So we've looked through this here. So this is that regression equation. So we're predicting X by knowing the intercept and then by working out how much to multiply X by. And then obviously there's some error left over at the end. But like all good things, in doing this, we're making a bunch of assumptions. So we're making the assumption, uh, firstly, that they're linearly related, so that every time x increase, increases, y increases proportionally. So we're, we're not allowing it to the, the, the relationship to, to wiggle in any way, shape, or form. It's all, we're assuming that it's always a straight relationship across the plot. We're also assuming that the data points are independent. Um, and that becomes important the more predictors you put in the model. So um, we're saying strictly that the value of x predicts y, but they're not contingent necessarily upon each other, nor are the x's if you use multiple. We're saying that we assume that the, the error is normally distributed, which I'll show you a little bit more about that in the, um, the next section when we look at how these models are predicted. And this uh, difficult to pronounce long word and its uh, partner, um, so uh, homoscedastic um, errors. So this means that we're saying the magnitude of the error is about the same all the way along. So if I just back up to this plot here, um, so the, the opposite of that is so-called heteroscedasticity, which is where the magnitude of the error varies. So if all of the data points were tightly clustered around here, but they got wider and wider and wider towards the end here, we, we would know that the magnitude of the variation at the, the far end of the plot is much higher than the magnitude of the variation at the bottom. And that would be violating the assumptions of regression because regression is assuming that the, roughly the error is about the same all the way along the range. So how do we estimate them then? So we've, we've, got, a, we've got a formula, but how do we estimate that formula? Well, it's usually estimated by a thing called ordinary least squares. And you don't have to work this out. The LM function does this for you. Um, but what it's actually doing is it's finding the so-called residual distance, which is those distance that the points were from the line, which is our error term. And it's going to work out that line by making sure the error is the smallest it possibly can be given the set of data points. So the way it does this, because if you sum these all up, they would equal zero. 
And machines don't like to do that quite as efficiently as they do to minimize completely from one side to zero. So we normally square them, so they all become positive, and then we mis minimize the sum of the squared error. Uh, so when you see terms like mean squared errors and sums of the squares in this, it's saying that we have squared the residual distance, and then we're trying to reduce it. So what that looks like visually is that each of the distances between these points in the line, this is a so-called residual. So we square each of these residual values, so they all become positive, and then LM minimizes them to work out where to put the line. So what does that look like once we create it? So you remember on the other slide, we created an LM object with this formula. So we had an LM linear model where Y, and this, um, this tilde here, this is um, R's formula syntax. So if you see that, it means um, essentially something is explained by the thing on the right-hand side. So Y is explained by X. So this is how you enter a regression formula. Quick question as well in the chat box if you... Yep. Sure. So how can errors be normally distributed at the same time um, of the same magnitude? Or are you referring to a different type of error there? Uh, I presume it's fairly rare to have equal distributed errors. Um, so, uh, so when I'm saying normally distributed, I, I mean, it's, I, it's, I probably mis, misspoke. I, I mean randomly distributed errors of approximately the same magnitude across the whole range. Um, uh, yes, the, var the, variance of the, error, the variance is a more correct term, yes. Um, but in terms of describing the, the size of those, I was using the term magnitude to explain that. But yes, uh, the, 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 the term variance is what you would normally use, but we would normally, uh, when we move to generalized linear models, we would exclusively talk in terms of variance because there's no error term in a generalized linear model. So in that sense, we're talking about the magnitude of the residuals. Um, so just nipping back to this model here. So what I've done there is having created a model, I've used the summary function on that model, summary z. And we'll skip through the first few bits aside from this is the call. This tells you what model you created. Skip over this for a minute and we'll go down to the regression coefficients. So if we remember that slide before where we had the beta, the beta that we multiply x by is this estimate here. So we multiply x by 1.25, which sounds suspiciously familiar given that I generated the data based on 1.25 times it. Uh, so it's doing the job we expect. So we're saying we have a, an estimated starting value here, which is our intercept. So the alpha is 5.477. And then for each X, we multiply it by 1.25. And that will then predict our Y with a measure of error. The other things we've got here are the standard errors for each of those estimates. Um, there is then a probability test performed on them, which in this case uh, is a T test. So we have T values here and we have, uh, again, probability values here, so P values. So if we're retaining that 95% threshold that we used for the correlation and is common in these sorts of approaches, uh, if this is less than 0 0.05, we have a significant coefficient. And R has a, a handy helper syntax here, which if you can see underneath, it's a significance codes. So the number of asterisks tell you how significant it is. So if it's between 0.1 and 1, there's no asterisk code. If it's between 0.5 and 0.1, you'd see a single full stop there. If it's between 0.1 and 0.5, a single asterisk, etc. So if we've got three asterisks there, it means it's a highly significant one based on a 95% threshold. And the other bits that we have underneath here, so these are the, um, if you're concerned with the number of parameters you're estimating, which I'm not going to go into today particularly, but you have the residual standard error and the degrees of freedom the model is using. And I mentioned before R squared as well. So R squared here is um, the proportion of the variation explained by the model. So if we interpret that uh, as if it was a percentage, we're saying here, uh, and I'd suggest that as you enter more terms into the model, um, move to the adjusted R squared rather than the multiple R squared because um, there are a couple of different ways to adjust it for more than one parameter, but that one is uh, generally a, a slightly more useful one. 
So we're saying here that we've got 0.73 or 70, sorry, uh, 0.743 or 74.3 percent of our variation in y is explained by x. And if you had more predictors, it would be the proportion of the variation in y explained by our model. But as we only have one predictor, it's just x. So you can then uh, apply further tests to it. Um, often we use F tests if we have more things um, in the model than just the T and we have more uh, predictors as well because uh, T tests um, are similar to normal distributions and it's based on the T distribution, but they have a, a fatter tail at the end essentially to deal with small numbers. So there was quite a lot to go through there, but one very important thing to add before we go into an exercise is that we need to interpret it really, don't we? So having seen that we have a regression coefficient, our interpretation then becomes for each increase of one in our X variable, Y increases by, in this case, 1.25, but we started at 5.48, so our, um, our intercept. Now you can arrange that sentence in all sorts of different ways. But the important point there is our regression, our start, our, our regression intercept, our starting point was 5.48, which we read off from here. And that for each increase of one in X, Y is increasing by 1.25. There is a further addition to it, which you'll often see. Um, uh, so at this point, it's perfectly possible to have a zero Y, which is, sorry, a zero X value, which in some cases doesn't make a lot of sense. But a common approach is to scale our variables. Uh, so when I say scale, what I mean is we mean center and we scale it. So for our x variable, we take the mean x away from it and we divide by the standard deviation of x. And that's a thing called a z score, if anyone's familiar with that. But that might seem a bit of a weird thing to do, but it then changes our model so that each change in x represents the change of one standard deviation. Um, so it rescales the model. It doesn't affect how much variation it explains at all, because it's still the same predictor. It's just a rescaled version of X. But the nice thing when you do this, so I've just clicked over to the scale model here, and you'll see if I flip between the two, none of this model information at the bottom changes, because it's the same model, but the magnitude of the um, estimates has changed here. And the nice thing about scaled is that once you do this scale, this mean scale, this mean centered and scaled, our intercept value becomes the average value for y. So we're saying the average value for y is 18.24. And for each standard deviation increase, y increases 4.24. 72 or 4.73. So that might seem a strange way to do it, but um, the reason you do that is you put it on a standard scale. So whatever the size of the uh, X variable, you might have an X variable that's measured in a scale from 0.5 to one. And then you might have a second X variable that's measured in 10,000 to 100,000. And the scale difference there can be quite confusing. So rescaling each predictor in this way, turning them into a Z score, puts them all on a common scale that you can use, and it makes the intercept more useful as the, the average value. So as I say, uh, when you go through the slides, you can see this here, but the intercept becomes our average Y value. The beta becomes the change for one standard deviation. So applying it to our model, we're saying our average, um, so that should be average Y, sorry, I'll update the slides for that, is 18.2, and each increase of one standard deviation increases y by 4.72. So the very final thing, if we created a model like this, how do we know if it's rubbish? Because if it is rubbish, we don't really want to use it. So one of the common things to do is to plot the residuals. So if you remember our assumptions before about the, uh, the randomly distributed error across the range, when we look at the residuals versus the fitted values. So the fitted values are the values that the model would predict. We would hope that they were just normally distributed across the range. So this red line should be best part flat across the range following this dotted line here. 
and it looks pretty close. And another version of this is the normal QQ plot. So uh, if you're familiar with QQ plots, there are a certain take on this sort of thing, but we have a standardized version of the residuals uh, versus where they should be theoretically. So if they line up perfectly across this dotted line here, then you have the dream model. But if they mostly line up across it, then you have a reasonably good model. Uh, for areas where you see that it deviates away, um, it's suggesting that the variance is not equal across the whole range of the model. So looking at that there, I'd say that's probably acceptable given that we only have a single predictor and it's a, it's a setup model anyway. Um, but you may, if you have a model that systematically deviates away from this, want to do something about it. It tends to deviate in the tails anyway, so that's a sort of common part of this plot. And similarly, um, if you work your way through the others here, these are standardized residuals, so it's just a, um, a transformed version of the one that's above. Um, we're not going to talk about what leverage is today, but you have a, a fourth diagnostic here, which looks at any particularly influential variables. So that was a lot to go through. Um, so what I'm going to do um, for the moment is stop there. So we're at um, just coming up to 10 past 10. So what we're going to do is pick up on the first exercise. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. I mean, in fact, no, I'll just show you the exercise first of all. Um, and then we'll have uh, 20 minutes or so to start working your way through this. And then I'll bring up the exercise and I'll go through it myself. Um, what we'll do is we'll put you into breakout groups uh, in just a minute. And if it benefits you to discuss those in the groups um, uh, to get an idea, particularly if any of the instructions are unclear, then uh, please do talk to the people you're in the groups with. Um, I will dip in and out of groups if I'm able to. Um, so just let our Studio Cloud refresh because it, uh, if it's not used for a little while, it does tend to go to sleep. It needs to just wake up again. So if you go down here to um, exercises one and two, you can pick that up. Now, I don't recommend that you go straight for the cheat option of the solutions folder, but should you want to, um, should this be really confusing you, for example, and you want some pointers or you're not sure how to plot some of the things, then uh, I have solutions here in this folder. So do go into the solutions folder and pick them up and have a look at those there as well. But what this exercise is, it's picking up the Framingham data set. And there's an overview here of what Framingham is here, but it's a heart disease study, uh, sort of a famous, uh, uh, sort of a public health famous example, if you like. So we have the data frame here. So if you run this, it will load the Framingham data frame into your environment here. And they have a whole bunch of things in that table. So I've then got a little key here explaining what the different columns are. So it's not necessarily all of them, but it's most of them. It's the things that you might be interested in using. So if you then look into part one, which is a linear regression with a single predictor, and then start stepping your way through. So just have a little look at the data set. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the uh, relationship between systolic blood pressure and BMI. And we're going to see if those are uh, linked. So what you'll have to start doing in the first steps here is to visualize CISBP, which is the, the column here, systolic blood pressure uh, and BMI to see whether or not there's anything related. So it's your choice of plot. If you like histograms, go with that. If you like scatter plots, go with that. Uh, if um, box plots help you, you know, go with that as well. So wh whatever you like to visualize that to get an idea of the relationships. So here I've suggested drawing a histogram, but you can also do a scatter plot. Then I'm asking you to build a linear regression. So now I haven't got my slides on the screen, which is the, the problem of doing this online because normally I would just leave them on a board while we do this in a room. Um, but in here, I do have a tutorial lookup, which is a PDF, which has the syntax for doing these models here. Or you can pick it up from the slides or the solutions as well. So here is where we're gonna use the LM function and then we're going to use a summary function on LM to see the coefficients and start interpreting them. So 
if we uh, if I stop talking there for now, I'll put you into breakout rooms. Um, if we could come back at um, half past ten, we'll have a look at that there. Uh, if you need to go and get a, get a coffee, have a short break, then feel free to. Um, I, I will start going through this at half ten. Alex, are you able to do the um, breakout rooms, please? Yeah, yeah, we'll do that, Greg. Thanks. Let's go to five rooms, shall we? And people should be getting invites to join breakout rooms now. Can you see, Chris, how to move between rooms? Uh, I can see breakout rooms on the bottom. If I click on that, it says so you've been assigned to breakout room one. Do you then just jump through them in sequence? I think you can just selectively move, so there are six in total. Uh, okay, cool. I'll give people um, some time first to, to have a go. Yeah. Uh, because I'll, I'll start recording, I'll pause the recording and then start again when um, when you kind of go through them half past. Sure, thanks. Great. Okay. We're away. Brilliant. Okay, doke. Thanks, uh, everyone. So what I'm going to do is just uh, run through that exercise and give you a bit of context and talk about how um, I uh, have sort of set it up and what, what I think you should be seeing. So. The instructions here said about loading the Framingham heart disease study. Um, so it's a cohort study. So there's a bunch of different predictors about the different people, the different patients in the study. Uh, so we read the data in from the Framingham data frame, which is in the data folder. And then the columns here describe the different bits and pieces in that data frame. So you can use summary under here, if you like, on the table, which gives you um, the sort of quantiles of stuff, but actually stuff's not perfectly formatted, so some of them aren't hugely helpful. We can use the view function, which opens it up, and you'd see it um, in a more kind of interactive window, a bit more like a spreadsheet. So I suggested that a good first step is to look at the distributions of the variables. Um, so I think that having a look at the distribution of the outcome is quite important. So sysbp is the column that we're going to use. So you can either use base R function hist, um, and the data frame is called Framingham single M. This BP, you could do it like that. Or for those of us, me included, who like ggplot2, you might want to do ggplot. Framingham, I keep putting a double M in that. This is going to happen every time I type it, I bet. AES, this BP. Um, let's just make it pretty for the sake of it. Um, um, I'm going to use my default. I like this blue color, which is Dodger Blue 2. For some reason I remembered that one. Alpha equals 0 0.6 equals black. Because why not? So there we have a default ggplot histogram. And yes, it's probably a little bit skewed here. So we've got a slightly longer tail here for the upper region, which would sort of make sense because we've kind of got a hard limit of um, blood pressure doesn't really go much below here. Um, but there are a few upper outliers of patients who've got really high blood pressure. But it's kind of broadly normally distributed, and I'd be happy enough approaching that with a linear model. So let's um, then do a scatter and see the relationship then too. BMI. So um, I'm going to keep sysbp on there and put y um, BMI. Going to do um, point. Or in base R, it would just be plot and then the two next to each other. This will be a less pretty looking plot. So, yeah, so it's kind of unclear, I'd say. I mean, it, it does look like a cloud of points that broadly as CISBP, sorry, as BMI is increasing, CISBP is sort of increasing. So 
it doesn't look completely devoid of relationship, but it's not particularly strong by the looks of this. Um, so let's try and quantify that now then with a linear model. So I'm going to call this, um, and I'm terrible at naming things. This is supposed to be one of the hardest things in programming, naming things apparently. Um, I'm going to call it mod one. I'm going to create a linear model using sys BP explained by BMI. I'm going to tell it my data is Framingham, which hopefully I spelt right for once. Okay, so as that's created, you can see this has created an object. So the model object here is a large linear model, it says. Um, what this is, uh, for those of you who know the internals of R, uh, it's an S3 object. Um, so it's essentially a list of a bunch of different things and you can use functions to pull stuff out of it. So you could use, um, and, and it has a list of these functions if we were to go through the help. So if I looked at the cofs of mod one, it print the cofs there and you can pull out all the individual components of it. But I like to use summary because I think it gives you um, a nice output. There we go, so let's just increase that for a second. So what I've got there then is, uh, as you saw on the slide before, I've got the calls. That's telling me the model that I put in. This, um, for those of you who can read these sorts of things, this is a description of the distribution of the residuals. So the median should be the midpoint, the minimum value, the maximum value, and then the quartile, so 25%, 75%. Um, I, I personally find that a bit hard to read, so I'd probably rather plot them. Um, but the thing that we're interested in here is, so we're saying the intercept is 86. So starting at 86, for each increase of BMI, um, our systolic blood pressure increases by 1.76. And that's, compared to my model before, I've got the axes the wrong way around, so I'll just flip those axes on that. previous plot so it's easier to see as well Chris if that's all right sorry there's just a quick question um about oh, yeah. what if Go the data it. had have been skewed if the data had been skewed so you've got a few options so you can either use a, a model that um accounts for skewed data so you could um so, so that sort of model there um it's not a discrete variable if it was discrete you could use something like a Poisson distribution which assumes that um, so there are different classes of models that deal with those sorts of skew. Um, but one of the most common things to do is to transform it. So you might find that um, by putting something through a, a log transformation, it starts to look normal. So you would then put do, say, log BMI or, or log SysBP and do it that way. So it's common to transform variables um, and then apply a linear model. It's slightly less powerful approach than using a, a type of model that's calibrated for that sort of thing. But we'll look a little bit at a generalized linear model later on, but that's specifically for binary outcomes. But that GLM can be used for all sorts of different types of distributions. You just have to tell it which one. Um, so I'm just gonna, so I've just um, flipped the axis on that there. So you can see that there's a SysBP and BMI. And in fact, if I plot exactly the same thing that our linear model is doing, by using the linear model built into ggplot method equals lm, we'll see this. Okay. So it does think there's a relationship there, but it sort of, it, it doesn't look particularly well suited one to the regression. You see there's not a lot of points at this end, there's a few outliers there and it's not coping with this big peak there particularly. So looking at our model again, certainly looks like our intercept here. So we don't have anyone with a, with a BMI much below 15, well, below 15 at all. But so the intercept would be back up here somewhere. Um, but the intercept there being the 86. And then for each increase of one in BMI, SysBP goes up 1.76. Uh, and our adjusted R squared here is terrible. Um, so it's 0 0.1. So we're saying only about 10, well, uh, rounded up 11% or so um, of the variation is explained by this model. So that's confusing given that we've got significance there. 
But what that's saying to us now for interpretation purposes is that BMI is significantly associated with CISBP, but actually it's not the full picture of CISBP. There are lots of, presumably lots of unexplained variants associated with CISBP. So it might be that we need more predictors in the model. Uh, in fact, it's almost certain that we need more predictors in the model. So this, uh, to my mind, wouldn't be um, a suitable model just in isolation. So um, those points there were about explaining that. So uh, the variation it explains there is only about 10%. So let's do the same thing, but now we're going to do standardized. So, so let's just save time by copy pasting, like all good R users do regularly, <laughs> copy and paste and change. So I'm going to use a scale function here to scale BMI. Summary again, but this time on mod two. Okay, so having done that, so if you will remember from the slides at all that now our intercept becomes the average value. So the average CISBP here is 132. And for an increase of one standard deviation in BMI, our systolic blood pressure increases by 7.8. Uh, one eight. So it, but it's a different way of interpreting the same information, but you can see that the R squared, etc., is all still the same. Are you able to um, increase the font a little bit? Yeah, let me see if I can zoom that. Thank you. Okay, yep. Yeah, so we've there got the just R squared still just the same. So that comes to the end of that section. So uh, well done for having a crack at that. Certainly a few people I spoke to had got as far as doing the scale model. So uh, well done, we're going, we're, we're going great guns there. So I'll move back over to slides now and we'll talk about the next few things. Um, so that was one predictor and we had a model at the end where um, we had one predictor that was significant, but there was loads of variation that it wasn't explaining. So what if you wanted to add more than one predictor in? So regression's not limited to this. So if we try and draw that scatter plot with the line on it, it's two dimensions and it, that makes sense to our minds. Um, but the machine is not limited to those two dimensions. You can have as many dimensions as you want. Uh, I've tried to draw a three dimensional plot to try and illustrate it, but it just looks horrid. I'm no good at 3D plots and I certainly can't do four or five dimension plots. Um, but the machine is quite happy with that because all it's doing is it's laying out matrices and doing sums across all of them. But uh, oh, I'm missing an R there, but um, the important thing then is that once we've got more than one predictor, our interpretation of the coefficients changes slightly. So when we read off our coefficient, we have to hold all the others constant. So if we're saying that increasing um, BMI by one gives a certain coefficient, uh, we have to then add holding all other parameters constant. Because if you move more than one point, um, obviously you, you can't isolate the effects of anything. So our coefficients then become um, the effect of changing that predictor whilst holding all the others constant. But functionally, all you need to do then is add them using the plus symbol. So if I had a linear model here where I wanted to add a predictor called x1 and then add x2, x3, etc., as many predictors as you want. Now, there, there are some limits to the number of predictors. Um, so you obviously don't want more predictors than you have data points, for example. And there are various different rules of thumb depending on the type of model um, that you're using. But broadly, I would say um, a number of the more reputable people who teach on it would say you want sort of somewhere between 10 and 20 points per predictor that you have. Um, the more, the better, really but every rule of thumb you give will be wrong for a particular instance. So make sure you have plenty more data points than you do predictors. The other thing to think about is how do we handle categorical variables? So what we've done so far with BMI, that was a numeric variable. So we could interpret it in the terms of an increase in BMI of one, that, that makes total sense. But if you have a categorical variable, so um, let's say an admission method to a hospital where you could be um, elective, non-elective or transfer. 
Um, Non-elective is not two times elective. You know, it doesn't make sense in that way. So you can't have a numeric coefficient um, based on the order of things. So if we try and enter then something that's numeric into the model, first of all, R is not going to understand it because it's text. So you need to tell it that it's a data type that is categorical. And R has um, a data type for this, which is called a factor. So factors um, are R's internal rendering of categorical variables, and they can have um, they have labels, so they're coded to labels. Um, so if you change a column to a factor, R will understand that that the different variables in that factor are all levels of the same thing. So rather than understanding that in our admission method example, the values are free text for elective, non-elective, etc., it will understand them as categories one, two, and three. Category one has the label elective, category two has the label non-elective, etc. So it changes how it understands them internally. So how we then enter them into the model also changes. So factors are implicitly pivoted. So if we had the, uh, the idea of, ad of the admission method again, what R actually does is it then pivots this. So it would have a column for, is this elective, yes or no? Is this non-elective, less or no, as the next column? Is this transfer, yes or no, as the next column? So the idea is that for each level of the category, it creates a new factor, sorry, a new column in your model. And that column is coded zero, one. So it can sort of do the same math that it did previously. So in the presence of uh, category B, for example, um, it would add the coefficient from B times one because the X value of that is one. Whereas um, it would then give us zero value for A and C because it's category B. So to try and illustrate what this does, um, here I've taken a data frame where we have some categories and those categories are called A, B and C. So I've given them six values and in my data frame I've got A, B, C, C, A, B. So they're not ordered. Um, but I've, because I've called them a factor, R understands that it has three levels called A, B, and C. Now, when you tell um, your linear model that you are uh, predicting CISBP tilde with BMI, what it does in the background is it builds a model matrix for it to work on. So if you shortcut this process and just call model matrix directly, I've said build a model matrix on, this is a, a wildcard for all, on everything in this data frame here that I've just created. So actually the model matrix that it enters then is an intercept. So we have a constant intercept, which is what we saw in the model previously. And it has a column for category B and a column for category C. But you'll see that it's missing category A. So what this does when we do this so-called dummy coding is it assumes that one of the categories is the default. And it fits the model as if um, the data is from that category. And then the other variables it adds are the difference between A and that next one. So category B is the difference between A and B, the difference between C and A. So in cases here where we have row number one is zero, zero, that's because it's category A. In number two, where we have a B, you can see it's um, got a one here, so it's not an A and it's not a C. So it does this internal rendering where it pivots it out and it drops one of the reference levels. And you can change the reference level uh, by reordering the factor. Functionally, that doesn't change a lot about the model, but um, what it actually does um, from a computational perspective is it helps the machine if it has the majority group as the, uh, the, the default, if you like, as, as the highest level. We won't go into that any further today, but for those of you who that makes sense to, uh, whichever the majority class is, um, it will aid the computations. It'll make it a bit faster if that's the default. So that was a couple of little things targeted there on how do we add more predictors and what if those predictors are categories? So if you'd like to pick, go back over to exercise one and two, and then continue on with the second part, number two. Um, We'll put you back into the breakout rooms then. And we'll come back at uh, five past 11 then, if that's okay. Great. There we are.
Okay, Duke. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I'm just going to go and share my screen, and I'll work through the uh, next bit of it, and I'll point out the things that I think are most important, really, to take from that. Uh, so I'll just make that a little larger. So in the first exercise, we were creating a linear model with a single predictor. So what I'm going to do now is just copy that down to save myself typing, because, you know, traditional R-based laziness. Um, so I'm going to call this one model three. So here I've suggested, as well as BMI, let's use a predictor called current smoker. So we add another predictor in by adding the plus symbol and then the current smoker. So just before I run that, I'm going to scan up and see what the current smoker field actually means. So it's a zero or a one. So that is categorical, but actually there's a shortcut in the maths here. So um, zero times a coefficient is zero. And then one times a coefficient is the coefficient. So actually when you enter a binary thing into the model, uh, it's perfectly fine without you putting a factor around it. Um, it mathematically just works that if they are a smoker, they will get an additional coefficient added in this case. And if they're not, um, they won't have the additional coefficient added. So I'll just run that model and we can have a little look um, at what it says. So uh, summary mod three. So there we go. So summarizing that there. So I've got my linear model call here BMI plus current smoker. We've got our intercept, uh, which is 90. So that's slightly different than before because it was about 86, I think. So as you add more things in, which explain more things to the model, you'll find that the intercept will alter because the intercept uh, tends to soak up the um, variation in the model. So as you put more predictors in, there's less uncertainty for the intercept, if that makes sense. So here we can see from a parameter estimates position that current smoker status is significant. And it uh, appears that for uh, current smoker status, it appears to lower the blood pressure. And our adjusted R squared is slightly better. It's gone up to um, 0.11 from 0 0.10. So it's marginally better, but it's not explained very much more variation at all. So let's try with age instead. I'm just going to copy and paste that twice and alter it. So I'm going to change this to age. Uh -huh. So I'm going to just scoot straight down to the adjusted R squared here. So that's now gone up to 0.23. So actually age was quite important here. Age has uh, essentially doubled the amount of variation that we've explained in our model. So um, each increase of age um, increases it by 0.91 um, times age. So we start whilst holding all of the things constant. So we're starting to get into more complicated interpretations here. So let's combine them both. Given that they're both significant, let's see what the picture looks like when we've got BMI, current smoker, and age in the picture. Does that improve the model even further? Actually, it's a, ever so slight decline here in our um, adjusted R squared. Uh, interestingly, when I look at this here, our BMI and intercept are significant. Our current smoker status isn't significant. And our age is. So what could be responsible for this? Well, all manner of things. It doesn't tell us what's responsible for this. But I suspect, given that age explained more variation and then it's rendered current smoker status um, not significant, is that current smoker status was a proxy for age. So there were no young children um, who were smoking, hopefully. Um, so there was a confounding effect there where we were actually getting some of the effects of age that were better described in age that were being shown through current smoking status and when we have both of them in the model those effects are separated just to confirm um we mean a one unit increase in age is, is years right uh yes yeah uh, let me just check the coding of age 
uh, sorry, there's a question as well saying, do we need to disregard the model if we get the p-value not significant for the whole model um, and irrespective of the explanatory variables are significant? Um, so I think, again, I'm going to be an annoying statistician here and say all models are wrong, but some are useful. So um, it depends on the, the aim of your model. So um, if you're using a model for a predictive um, paradigm rather than an explanatory paradigm, you may be less concerned about whether individual parameters are significant, but whether the overall model is predictive. Whereas if you're looking for an explanatory model, you may be less interested in the overall predictive um, ability of the model, but you might be really interested in which individual parameters predict the outcome. So it does depend on how you use it. I'm just going to go back up and check the age here. Uh, so this age examination time, yes, yeah, so it is single years, I presume. So we need to remember our holding all other parameters constant here as well. But the last part in this here was adding in um, our education variable. Now, given that education is a categorical variable, we need to treat it as a factor so that the factor can do that pivoting that we described before, which is referred to as uh, dummy variables. So I'm going to um, build a model then with BMI, age and education. So let's take uh, this one, copy and paste and update it. So you can update um, the original data frame. So you could change the column in the data frame to make it a factor. Or you can um, specify directly in the model that you want this to be a factor. So I'm going to add um, education in here as a factor. So I'm just going to do it in the model in this instance. So it's important. Is that, to is that factor a, a base function compared to like a mutate? factor level kind of option. Yeah, so it, so it's a base R data type of factor, yes, yeah. So it's essentially it's a, a, a vector of labels. Yeah. Um, so you can use that in, in tidyverse paradigm and stuff, it, it would still uh, respect it as a, a factor, but no, it's a, it's a base R thing. Um, so here you can see we've now got coefficients for each factor level, up so two, three, and four. So it's treated factor level one as the default. So the average patient in this model is assumed to have um, a factor level of one. So just to understand what those factors are, I'm going to go back up to our coding at the top. So education here, we can see number one was some high school, which is probably a fair assumption because I, I assume that's the one that affects everyone. Then two is some high school or GED. So this is obviously US education system. Three, some college or vocational school and four college. So it looks like as they increase their sort of higher levels of attainment, um, presumably related to years in, in school. But importantly here, we've got 123 observations deleted due to missingness. So, uh, and Ina spotted this um, and asked in on the breakout rooms as well. So it's important to note that uh, if you use the, the help to, to help you, uh, as, as you might expect here, I've looked up what factor is. And it explains to me that factor here is a, a, a function to encode something as a factor. And it has an argument here called exclude. And it's got NAs. So anything that is an NA, it's going to exclude. So there are a number of missing values for education. So you can't have a missing value in a regression model uh, because it can't estimate it. So it either needs to replace it with something which is often referred to as imputing. So you can do things like put the mean or you could use fancy algorithms to work out what a likely value is. Um, or you can accept that that data row needs to be removed. So they're really your only options there. So the default is to remove them. So it's worth checking when you see this because um, not only are you losing data, but you may be losing data in a biased kind of way. So the um, the missingness may be due to some particular factor that like they may be a, an education level uh, for a patient who was educated outside the country, for example, and moved to the US before they entered the Framingham study. So that would mean that you're biasing that group. Um, so that's probably a bit outside the scope of today, but be aware that you do if you lose data points, it's worth investigating what those data points are and if you can identify why they're missing because it affects what's going on here. But as you can see here, factor level two, 
and factor level four appear to be significant. So it's a fairly good bet overall that education is helpful. And it has taken our uh, R squared up ever so slightly. It's not increased it loads based on um, the 0.23 of just age, but it has increased it slightly. But you can see there that education does appear to be uh, predictive. So it's interesting to, to consider what the effect of education would be on blood pressure. Um, because these models don't tell you anything about the reason and mechanism for it. It just tells you about the association. So it's saying that they are associated with effects on a group of patients with a different educational um, status. So whether that links to the sorts of jobs people do, um, whether, say, a manual job um, might be associated with an education level that might uh, have more occupational risk than other things and stuff like that. Of course, you can interpret it that way. But um, the model is completely blind to that. The model is just telling you about the associations in the data in front of you. So uh, beware of applying too much interpretation to these models. OK, so I'm going to move them back over to slides. And there's a couple of other things we're going to go through before we finish for today. So what about nonlinear data? And apologies now, we've got a few more sums, but uh, hopefully they'll explain the, the difference here. So the problem is that when we've got a nice linear thing like this, like blood pressure that we were predicting, um, it's kind of easy to use a linear model. And they're actually really powerful and they're a good way to do it. But many things we want to look at is are, are not linear in that sense. So some of the things that I use a lot in my professional life are using uh, the outcome of death, which is a binary. Uh, or the outcome of readmissions, which is a binary, that was someone readmission, readmitted, yes or no, or length of stay. But in the way that we use length of stay in HERS, we only have discrete dates. So someone was in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 days. No one was ever in 2.5 days because we don't have times in the HERS. So when you have a discrete data like that, that is a count, um, that's a different distribution. That's um, generally modelled by something called the Poisson distribution. Um, but you can specify all sorts of distributions in a generalised linear model. And just as the name implies, it's a generalisation of the linear model that you've just seen. In fact, it's a higher level framework. So um, the people who created the framework for generalised linear models would regard what we've just done, a linear regression, as a special case of the generalised linear model, um, where all the maths works very nicely. But to make it slightly more general, what they've done is they've said some transformation of um, this, um, I forget my Greek letters now, is it mu? Um, but that is actually the expectation of y. So see this as a transformed version of y is predicted by an intercept and a coefficient times each x. And you'll notice here that there's no separate error term. So the separate error term um, tends to be absorbed into the intercept in these models. Um, and it's referred to as the variance within the model. It's easy to split that out in a linear model because of the, the, um, the least squares way of doing things. But bear in mind that in a generalized linear model, we're not going to have a separate error term. The error is dealt with in a slightly different way. So what we're doing essentially is we're fitting a linear model, but on a transformed y variable and the transform is by applying some function to it um, so that function is generally referred to as the link function and for different distributions so like the binomial distribution or the Poisson distribution they have a particular link function so the Poisson distribution uses a natural logarithm whereas the um, a uh, binomial distribution, uh, for the most part, is modelled as a logistic regression using a logistic link function, which is a uh, sort of a log odds. So it's important to understand that we can't use the OLS from before, so the, uh, the least squares, you know, where we took the residual distance and squared it and then minimised it. That doesn't work because our data are not uh, linear in the same way that they were previously. They are essentially linear on the transformed scale. So what we do instead is we use uh, an estimation um, approach called maximum likelihood. Now, maximum likelihood works for linear models as well. It's just that OLS is quicker and, uh, and is actually equivalent in, this, in that framework. So generalized linear models are the higher 
hierarchy, if you like, that can all be estimated by a form of maximum likelihood. But the nice thing for you as a user who's just used a linear model is that most of GLMs, so the generalized linear model function, is the same. So you can pretty much build what you've just built, but specifying the distribution that it's using. But we also can't use the R squared again because that implies this OLS way of doing things. So there's a few other ways you can do it, and these do really depend slightly on the distribution. So there's an equivalent kind of thing to the R squared um, called the uh, area under the receiver operator characteristic curve. So that's a very big name, but it's often called the AUC or the C statistic. For any of you who've ever used a thing where there's a, a binary model, uh, something like, say, the uh, NHS Digital's Shimmy, which is a, a mortality metric, or uh, Dr. Foster's HSMR, or things like that, they'll be produced with a set of C statistics, which are much like R squared, so that they're a proportion of variation explained by the model. So it's a kind of binary equivalent of the R squared. Uh, but the one I actually like to use the most is a value called the AIC, uh, or the ACIC Information Criterion. The AIC doesn't mean much on its own, it's not directly interpretable, but it's a relative measure of the amount of information that a model uses, uh, sorry, loses. So uh, if you have a model with a smaller AIC than a previous model, uh, that would signify that that's a better model. So uh, if you're trying to iterate through to get a better model, um, following your um, AIC as it reduces is the way to do that. Or you can also use a likelihood ratio test, which is a um, a similar to a, so it's a probability test based on the, the maximum likelihood functions. So how do we do this? So what we need to do to make it the GLM is that we use the GLM function rather than the LM function, but we have to supply a family argument which tells it what type of data that it's using. So here I'm going to use um, the count library, um, which is a, a an R package that's associated with a particular uh, textbook that has a lot of categorical and binary data. And I'm using a data set from that called MedPAR, which um, is a set of uh, US medical data, a little bit similar to uh, our HES data um, from the early 90s. I think it's from Texas, actually. But in that data set, we have a number of patients. So I'm going to predict which patients died using some of the predictors that are there. So there's a factor for whether or not they were aged 80 or above. Uh, which actually doesn't need to be a factor, it could just be a binary, uh, that their length of stay and their type of patients, and they, uh, if you were to go into the help, you could read about the um, the, the different parts of uh, the data set and the codings of it. But to illustrate how it works is the GLM, same sort of function that we had before, the data set, and the distribution here for this binary is a binomial distribution. So we're, we're specifying a family of binomial. Uh, now I've just put the output into this um, other table here just to because I think it looks a little bit nicer. Um, but you really don't have to, you can just use summary. And I'd suggest in the exercise we just use summary. But there's a bunch of different um, helper functions that you can bolt on around all these regression things. So if you find that it's a bit hard to read or you want to use some functions from someone who's written a much better regression package, then uh, there's so many in the R universe, so I'd particularly recommend the SJplot package because it's got loads of these little helpful functions like a tab model. So that goes and takes a, a model and you can tell it which bits to show in the output table and it renders it nicely. So I probably didn't need to show the degrees of freedom there because it didn't work. But we've got the intercepts and we've got the p-values here. Now what I've done is I've told it to uh, exponentiate here, so it, it exponentiates by default. I'll explain that in a minute. So when we do these, build these models, we're building them on a transformed scale. So that's what the link function you'll see in a minute ago here does. So this is predicting the transformed y. So it will give you a linear predictor, so the, the coefficients from before, for the transformed y. But what you probably want to know is what they are on the real scale, so you want to transform them back. So the inverse of that function then gives you a thing called an odds ratio. So we then interpret an odds ratio um, as the, the, the multiplicative difference between them. And the other thing I said about before was the AUC or the C statistic. 
So this doesn't come out by default. So uh, I like to use the one from the model metrics package. So um, the double colon here pulls a function out of the package if you don't want to load it with library. So I'm saying here, pull out the AUC and this model here predicts death in the MedPAR data set um, explaining um, 0.637 or 63.7% of the variation in the data. So here we've got the same type of regression in many ways, but applied to a binary, applied to died yes or no. And the way we did that was by adding the family argument in to the GLM. Uh, Chris, can I just ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Uh, on the previous slide there, yeah. um, you know, within the LM and the GML, GLM uh, functions, do yeah. you need to, is the order of the arguments, like, uh, is that a necessary order? Uh, no, no. So the order of the arguments can be whichever order you want to put them in. Um, it will assume um, that the um, the first thing you're going to specify is a formula. So um, in our generally, uh, whichever the order, um, sorry, let me just go back to cloud. Uh, whichever the order is in the help, if you don't tell it what the arguments are, it will assume it's those. So I haven't told it in this case, formula equals. I've just put what it equals, so it will assume that's formula. But if you explicitly declare it, so let's pull up LM. So it's going to assume that you're giving it a formula and then the data set and then a subset and then wait if you don't name them. But if you name them like this here, data equals, you could put that in any position. Yeah, Does that so makes sense. It just felt slightly, because um, I'm kind of mostly used, used to using kind of tidy about stuff where I would say data and then pipe it into. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if, if you prefer to code it that way, yeah, you totally can. All you would need to do is um, arrange it so that that's there, but you name the arguments. So um, that would be data. And this would be uh, formula. Yeah, and okay. then it would be fine. Uh, I'll just head back over and finish off on those slides. Um, so I think we're getting a little bit close on uh, time now. So what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to skip this interactions section um, just so we, we make sure we finish on time. But I'll explain if you want to go through this for yourself that uh, interactions um, are the idea that um, not all effects are born equal necessarily. Some of them interact with each other. So if you have an X1 and an X2, but actually the product of X1 and X2 together is greater than the sum of their parts. You can do that with a multiply, uh, multiplication symbol. Um, so do do go through and have a read of the uh, the ins and outs of it if you want to go into that. But I think we're probably going a little bit far for today, and I'd probably prefer that you um, do the um, the exercises. So I'll skip over that. Uh, so our model coefficients then um, in LM were, were just multipliers, as I said before. Um, and GLM, because it's on the scale of our link function, we want to back transform it. So here, I've taken both of those out of the model. So this is what you would get from the default summary. But because I wanted to transform it back onto this right scale, I've exponentiated them, which is the inverse of the, the function. Um, so if you want to interpret them on the log odds scale, that's fine. But I don't really know what log odds is particularly it doesn't make it's not intuitive sense so i would prefer to have um, an odds ratio uh, so depending on the type of distribution used uh, if you do the same transformation back in uh, poisson it's an incident rate ratio for example um, but have a look at that as you go into the exercise or we'll just look at the linear predictors so what we're going to do is pick up exercise three and we're going to um, this time predict something that's binary rather than um, linear as we have done previously. So let me just go and pick up that next exercise. So uh, I've changed the data set there. So yeah, forgive me. So follow, just follow through the first bit and load the NHSR data sets package. i load the length of stay model data frame, then have a little look. This is essentially a, a very, very cut down version of HES. Um, where you might have a patient with a particular ID, the organization they came from, their age, their length of stay, and whether or not they died coded as a zero one. So what we're gonna do then is build a GLM to predict death. And we'll look at using age and other things to do that. So um, 
let's have 15 minutes or so on that uh, and we'll go back into breakout rooms and then we'll come back and we'll put this together what I'm going to do now then is go through the exercise um, so there's quite a lot in this exercise um, and I realize we're under a bit of time pressure today so I'll run through my answers now and explain my interpretations of things um, let me just check are you on my R Studio screen now? I think we are, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, oh, great, thank you. Okay, so in exercise three, so firstly, um, got an old redundant note. Um, we're using the NHSR um, datasets package. Uh, on a side note, if you're interested in this, this is a package we put together with a bunch of healthcare related data sets for people to learn R with. Um, so if you have a, a data set that you think would be interesting or be helpful, um, we'd really value you contributing that uh, if you're able to share that. So um, give us a shout on GitHub uh, and see if you if you have something to contribute. So I'm going to load the length of stay model, which so as I said before in the intro, um, is a, a little bit like a very reduced hairs where we've got a patient ID, the trust, the age, the length of stay, and whether or not they died. Code is zero one, so one being a death. So that's obviously a binary. So the way we move our GLM on from the LM is to use the GLM function, as we discussed in the slides. We're using death here as our Y variable, so we're predicting death. But we also have to specify a family, and that family is binomial. So if for any reason you forget to put the family in, um, which is a perfectly normal thing to do, I've done that on many occasions myself, it has a default value. And when you look that up in the help here, it tells me the default value is Gaussian. So Gaussian is the other name for the normal distribution. So a Gaussian GLM is exactly the same as an LM, a linear model. So uh, if you don't specify the family, what it's fitting is a linear model. So if I run that here, then I run the summary. And here we have then a very similar output from before. We have our coefficients, but remember that these are on the log uh, sorry, the logit scales, these are on the transformed scale. So it's not as directly interpretable as it was before. But we have still a significant intercept and significance for age. Uh, and we have an AIC value. Now that's no use in isolation, but it's useful, useful when we're comparing models. So if our next model has a smaller AIC, then we know that our model is incrementally better. Um, and that's appropriate when you're building a model on the same data set to look at the uh, changes in AIC. Um, but what you can also do, I mentioned earlier the AUC, which is a sort of equivalent to the R squared for this, which is the area under the receiver operator cur characteristic curve. Um, the, the easiest version of this, because there's quite a, there's a few versions of this I find, is in the model metrics package. So you can either pull it directly out of model metrics using the double colon operator. So that's without loading the model metrics package or in the more kind of standard way where you load model metrics and then you run a AUC. So here I've got an AUC of 0.594, so or would be 595 with rounding. So we're saying our model predicts 59.5% of the variation in death. So that's quite a lot for age, but then as you you probably expect that, right? So age is quite predictive of death um, for most of the population. Uh, so is age significant? Well, yes, it is. Um, it, as I say, it's kind of hard to interpret on the um, the log odds scale, but um, we can see that there is the change in log odds here for each increase in age, and we have our intercept on log odds scale as well. So it's a bit confusing, but let's do it with a scaled model instead. So exactly the same thing, but with a scale on age. So you'll see it hasn't really changed anything and because it's on the log scale, it doesn't really help again. So the average log odds of death now is minus 1.57, but it's increasing by 0.33 for each standard deviation in age. So it's fine, but it doesn't really make it that interpretable. So one of the things you can do is to pull out the coefficients using the coef function 
and the reversal of the link function is the exponentiation or exp. So if I run that for both of these, you'll see the exponentiated coefficients. So these are now the odds ratios for the intercepts and the age. So it's a bit tricky on intercept because what's the intercept compared against, but um, it sort of makes sense mathematically. But um, the odds of death are then multiplied by our 1.012 for each increase of 1 in age. So when you're using a GLM, you have got that added level of complexity of whether or not you're turning the link function backwards, so you're reversing the link function. So if you're building a predictive model, um, like many a machine learning model is, um, you're not always interested in the parameter estimates, the coefficients. You're more interested in the R squared or the AUC. Um, whereas if you're building a, an explanatory model, as they're often used in clinical studies, where you're trying to understand which factors um, influence something, then you really are interested in the interpretation of those coefficients. So let's continue to add some things in. So adding age and length of stay. So now, actually confusingly, it looks like age is not significant in the presence of length of stay, that actually length of stay is significant and that's driving the model. Um, and actually our AIC there is 273, whereas before it was 279. So the, in, the decrease in AIC is saying that actually with length of stay, it's a better model. So that's a bit confusing, right? Um, how would age not be predictive of death? Surely that's kind of weird. Um, so let's have a look at the ARCs together. And yes, indeed, the newer one is better. But um, I've just illustrated the, the different ways you can test this with a few different functions here. This is in my uh, 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 answer section. But um, so the larger model is better, but it's kind of strange. Now, we skipped over the ins and outs of the um, interaction section, but that's because age and length of stay interact with each other. Patients who are older are generally in hospital longer, and that doesn't mean that it's length of stay or age necessarily. It's a combination of the two that are important. So when you add these two together with this uh, multiplicative term rather than the plus, you get a more complex model which has an extra term. So do go back through and read that slide at your leisure, but we've now got a coefficient for age, a coefficient for length of stay, and a multiplicative coefficient for age and length of stay together. So the way you go about interpreting that is that ultimately for patients who are both very old and in hospital for a very long time, the combination of those two um, is blunted by this negative coefficient. So our model is saying um, you're at higher risk of death if you're in hospital for a long time or you're elderly, but if you're elderly and in hospital for a long time, you need to take the edge off that because it's not quite as the sum of the two, if that makes sense. Because elderly people in general are in hospital longer. So then let's look at the AUC of that model then with the extra term added and we've gone up there okay so we've gone up to 0.7 there so that is a much better model so including that interaction there was important so I know that's a bit more complicated there but the essence of a GLM is that it's really similar to an LM but you need to be aware of what scale you're putting it on so what family argument are you putting it on binomial for um, a binary uh, Poisson for something like a count uh, there's lots more special cases. So if you have things like over dispersed count data, you would use a negative binomial. Um, and for those people who work in areas where you, you have more specific applications, I'm sure you could list them for me. But uh, I pretty much always work with binary things or um, with counts. So uh, Chris, can I just yeah. ask um, in terms of the interpretation, um, your, that was an odds ratio, right? The, the, yeah. You got to eventually and you with one increase you times it by 1.014 yeah. or whatever it was or one two yeah is that the at that point can you also make the statement that um, you're 12 percent more likely is that another way of wording that um 
So this is where I will confess, just like many a person, my uh, inadequacy of remembering every single method. <laughs> so yeah. I would have to go and um, refresh my mind of the odds ratio, the, the definitions of odds ratios. Uh, I'm not entirely sure you could use it like that because I think that's more like a relative risk interpretation. Right. Because odds yeah. ratios and relative risks are sort of similar, but they're not quite the same. Um, so th these are a sort of a foundation of many a public health course and stuff as well. So forgive me yeah. that it's not tripping off the tongue today, um, but I can well, certainly that, go that's and what was, that's find what was that out and email is. anyone who's interested. I mean, if any, anyone in the, anyone in the in the group, if that springs to mind, by all means to enlighten me in the chat. But yeah. they're ringing bells from public health courses and yeah, yeah, yeah. Below below one, it's like if like zero point nine four nine six, you would then say you're six percent less. Yeah, yeah, something. and I, I'm pretty sure you can do that with the relative risk ratios, but I'm yeah. not entirely sure about the odds ratio. Yeah, no, leave that one for now. Okay, doke. So I'm going to aim to go through to um, quarter past now, and I'm just going to pick up on the very last thing that I think is a, a, of importance for you today. So, given that you built a model, you probably want to use that model to predict future data. Um, so you might just be interested in, in what causes something and, and analysing the relationships, but very often you want to then use this model you built on some training data to predict onto some new data. Um, and that's really easy to do with these saved models. Uh, and that's the basis in many ways of how we evaluate whether they're any good or not. We compare the residuals against fitted and things like that. So to predict with these models, um, we want to predict on our expected Y. So um, we uh, so we need to decide um, what scale we want to do the prediction on if we're using a GLM. If you're using a linear model because it's only on the standard scale, uh, strictly it's actually the identity link function, but um, you can tell it to predict either on the scale of the log odds, um, which I don't think is hugely helpful, or you can tell it to predict on the response scale, which is the probability of the event in this case. So what I want to do here is I want to take this set of data um, and then uh, using the model I built earlier in these slides, predict the risk of death for that patient. So what I've done here is I've created a new variable in the data set, just using some sort of normalish dplyr bits underneath. But I've used the predict function, and the predict function takes um, at least two things and generally three. So it takes a model to tell it to predict from, and these are fairly generic. So if you built a regression model, if you built a random forest, you built all sorts of other things, they normally all use predict when you want to use this uh, prediction uh, function. Then I'm telling it here that the type of prediction I want is on the response scale. So I'm saying I want it to be transformed back so I have the probability of the event. So I'm creating a new column here called PREDS, which is the probability of death for these patients. And what I've then done underneath with this top N, I'm putting it into a knitted table just because it looks a bit nicer, is I've just rearranged it for the, the top five probabilities of death. So the patients who looked most likely to die um, according to our model. And actually they're really quite high um, probabilities of death. Um, so according to this, um, they have these length of stays, um, they have had this death status. So, so all of those patients that we predicted with the highest risk of death did actually die. So when you're then validating your model, that's a sort of an important metric. But once you've got your predictions, you can use them to inform a whole lot of other analyses. So um, you can then try and uh, pull out the, the ones with the highest uh, risks of death, the lowest risk of death. So one of the things that we would do sometimes in mortality analyses is that we would, uh, for a particular group, let's say a particular group has uh, more deaths than expected, we might pull out the patients who died who had the lowest probability of death. So our model was saying we didn't really expect those patients to die, yet they did. So can we then try and work out what went on there? Does that need to lead to a clinical audit? Does that need to um, link to some other data set where we can find out some more information? So you can use the probabilities from your model then to drive your further analyses. So this is a reasonably simple thing to do, um, but I'm, what I'm going to do in this exercise, I'm going to go uh, until, uh, just give you the 10 minutes for it, um, put it through the predict function, 
and then try and plot your predictions and then we'll come back for five minutes and I'll show you my plots of the predictions uh, and then we'll wrap up. Can we go back into uh, breakouts for just 10 minutes, please? Okay. Back to one. Oh, you're muted, Chris. Uh, and 2020 classic phrase of sorry, I was muted. Um, but yeah, so welcome back, everyone. So this is the last bit that we're going to go through today. So the idea is having got a model uh, and any of the models that we built today, you can use this on. Uh, let's use that to predict uh, onto uh, uh, either the same data set or another data set. In this case, we're reusing the one that we've already used previously. Uh, there is a little bit of a known gotcha in there, which relates to what um, Ina pointed out earlier. And we said in the, um, the things coming back and um, Sally's just encountered the, uh, as well, is that if you don't specify the new data argument, um, you might get tripped over by the number of NAs not matching. So I'll show you my screen now and show you um, my way of doing that. OK, so we're back into our Studio Cloud here. So for exercise four here, firstly, I'm using um, the last linear model I created in exercise one. So that was this model here, and I'd called it model six, which is the linear model on the Framingham data, where the formula was for the SysBP, predicted by BMI, age, and education. So I'm using that model by the, the reference to its name. So if I go back over here, so I'm saying create in my Framingham data frame a new column called preds. And that preds is the result of this predict function on a linear model. Now, if you don't specify anything else there, all it will do is it will pull the predictions out of the model object. Now, if I don't know if you'll remember, but we had 123 missing rows there because of missing values for education. So if you try and do that with just LM, so I with just that, it won't work because the number of rows is wrong. But what we're doing here is we're going to use the new data argument to tell it to fit to the Framingham data frame. Now, we know the Framingham data frame is not new data. It's the one it trained it on. But it's now treating it as if it's new data. So anywhere it's got an NA, it will just ignore. So um, it will carry on without tripping itself over. So if I run that there, you'll see now in Framingham, if I just view that, and I have a column called Preds here which is the predicted systolic blood pressure for each of those patients. So now you've got that, it's a data item for you to work with. So you could plot that in different ways, depending on what it is you want to see. So firstly, I'm just going to do a quick comparison there of the systolic blood pressure. So what we were predicting against PREDS, our predicted value. So let's see, how well did our model do? Well, it's kind of a bit all over the shop, really, isn't it? So this is what the actual systolic blood pressure is, but then it, it's obviously quite variable. So whereas our predicted value is here. So if this was perfect, we would have a nice tight line going up. Uh, now it never will be perfect, obviously, but um, the better model you get, the tighter the clusters will be. And you will still probably have some outliers, um, but the, the tighter it will, the predictions will resemble the actual um, source data. What I'm going to do now is try the same thing, but on the logistic model. So the last one of my logistic models was GLM4, which was that one with the interaction in that I said before. So doing the same thing here, I'm telling it predict GLM4. I'm giving it the new data again, but this time, because it's a GLM, I need to tell it response type, so the, the probability, rather than the predictions on the transformed scale, because they don't really mean a lot. So in my length of stay models now, now I have a, a column called PREDS, which is the probability of death. Now, if we try and do the same plot that we just did on that, look what we get. Something kind of useless, but that's because our original predictor is binary. It's only ever zero, one. So we're gonna have some weird values here. So you can see there's a few that it's given really high probabilities to. 
but it's actually not a very helpful plot at all. So how else could we visualize it? Well, the easier way to do it then would be to reflect it into groups in somehow. So here I'm going to put uh, a box plot there. So I'm, I'm grouping them up into the patients who survived and the patients who died. And this here, PREDS, is the probability of death. So we can see the average probability of death in patients who died was higher. So this is the, the median line in a box plot. So the distribution was higher and obviously there are a few very high outliers there. Or you can do any of the... Um, some people hate these, but I think they're all right. Um, violin plots of the same thing. Um, they're a bit more kind of visually interesting. Um, but equally, you could do things like look at the um, the quantiles of the um, the groups or plot histograms over them. Um, or you could use the dplyr functions that we showed in the uh, the slides where we were looking for the ones that had the highest probabilities of death or the lowest probabilities of death. For things like the shimmy and the HSMR, which are mortality metrics that we uh, produce in HED, um, what we actually do is we end up transforming them into uh, groups by counting them up um, per hospital. So we have the sum of the number of deaths and the sum of the probability of deaths, and that forms a ratio. So you can plot that ratio uh, against a measure of the size, and you can do things like funnel plots, uh, and you can look at them in that sort of way. So it depends what you want to use your model for, obviously, but um, with something like a binary one, you need to do some form of grouping if you want to plot it, because it doesn't make sense, because your y is only ever 0 or 1. OK. So then just to wrap up. So we started off by thinking about relationships between um, data items. So how can we tell uh, if we've got relationships between some of the data items? Uh, correlation coefficients are a measure of the strength of association and the direction of the association, um, but they're kind of limited in their um, their outputs and the, this the diagnosis of the of how well they fit. They also make very linear assumptions. Um, if we move into a regression uh, model we get a lot more control over exactly how we parameterize it and we can put lots of predictors into models. So if we have a data set with various different predictors, we can add them all together. So they're equally at home with single or multiple predictors, as I said. Um, and when we were looking at them, we were looking at the idea of predicting a Y um, variable using an X or as many X's as we wanted. And they produced a regression coefficient. And that coefficient was the thing that we multiplied each of our predictors by to find how much they affect the outcome, so the, the y variable. How much do we multiply x by um, to, uh, sorry, how much does one ch a change of 1 in x uh, change y? For our linear models, we used r squared, which was a measure of uh, how much of the variation in our data set that our model explained. For our logistic models, our GLMs, we used uh, things like C-statistics, which are an equivalent kind of measure where we're looking at uh, the how much the probability of the outcome was explained by the predictors. So for when you want a measure of global model fit, you want something like R-squared or you could use C-statistics. When we moved into the so-called generalised linear model, we were keeping our linear model framework, but we were doing it on a transformed scale. So we transformed the y variable. So if y was a 0, 1, we used a binomial family and a logit transformation to change that into the log odds of death, which is then fitted with the linear model. We also looked at uh, ever so briefly, and I'm afraid I skipped over some of the details, but you saw it on the exercise, the idea of interaction terms. And interactions are where the effects of one variable are not constant um, in the presence of another one. So we use the example of age and length of stay predicting death. So increasing age was predictive of death and increasing length of stay was predictive of death. But for people of um, high, large age and large length of stay values, the sum was too great. So the interaction term blunted that slightly. And then finally, once you have a built model object of any kind, be it a linear model, a GLM, um, a 
regression tree, a random forest, a boosting model, whatever it is, um, R's generic predict function is usually the way to uh, make a prediction using that model. We normally specify uh, a new data argument. Uh, so even if you're fitting it back to the same data set, using the new data argument is kind of helpful because it allows you to skip the NAs. And where we used the GLMs, we also supplied the type being the response because we wanted it back on the original scale rather than the transformed scale. OK, so I'm going to stop there for today. Uh, and for those of you who are particularly keen or really want to wrap your head around using regression uh, and sort of pushing it further and sharpening your skills, building a model, exercise five in the materials is um, the opportunity to predict the 10 year um, CHD risk from the Framingham data set. Uh, oh, sorry, let me just uh, take that back over. So the exercise then, should you want to do it? And feel free to have a stab and we can talk about it on Slack or you can email me um, or you can compare against my um, uh, sort of solution in here. Is to start with the Framingham data set again. Again, I've got a list of the columns here. But what we want to predict here is this 10 year CHD. So we want to try and predict the best model we can to predict 10 year CHD. And I will scoot up there, but I will give you the clue that it's a GLM and it's a binary, so it's a yes, no. So consider some of the variables. Some of them are categories, some of them are not. See which ones are predictive. If they are predictive, leave them in the model, and then you can compare between your models with things like the AIC and whether or not the C statistic uh, increases. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time today. I hope you've got some useful stuff out of this. Um, it is tricky to do this sort of thing online because normally I'll be floating around a room and looking at your screen and helping you with bits and pieces. Um, but I'm more than happy to take uh, questions now or if you want to drop me a line um, either via email or um, via Slack or through NHSR community, then you're more than welcome to. OK, thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks, Chris. I'll just stop the recording here.